Hello. What makes an instrument an instrument? Is it in the sound of an instrument and the way that that sound pulls at our memories, touches our hearts, and tickles our ears? Or is it something in the look and feel of an instrument, the way a musician can articulate a note over time that takes a static sound and turns it into one full of feeling and intention? Some synthesizers are simply big boxes of knobs and cables. And while they may seem to lack a place for human expression, new techniques for expression can be developed via a subtle knob turn here or the sudden insertion of a cable there. Other synthesizers have more familiar interfaces like a keyboard that allows a musician to expressively play. In this lesson, we're gonna look at dynamics, how to control and articulate a note over time and how you yourself can become a part of the circuit. What are the defining characteristics of a musical sound? This could be a note played on a guitar or the synthesized kick drum from a drum machine. Or it could be the ambient wash of the sea or the sound of a car horn blaring from the street outside or a spoken word from a movie. In general, sounds have three primary characteristics. The first is pitch. Is a sound pitched or unpitched? When I play a note, can I sing along with it? Or is it a sound full of texture, but which lacks a clear tonal center? While sounds in nature tend to be unpitched, musical sounds tend to be pitched so that we can play with things like melody, harmony, chords, and scales. In the next lecture, we will look at the oscillator, the main source of tonal material on a synthesizer and the place where pitch is generated. The second characteristic is timbre. Timbre can be a bit tricky to describe, but in general, it's what allows us to distinguish sounds apart. Say, the sound of a plucked guitar string or a blown tuba. If you and I sing the same note, it's timbre that allows us to distinguish our two voices. If I play the same note on the synthesizer, I can make timbral changes to distinguish these sounds. The third and final characteristic of a sound is its amplitude or volume. Is the sound loud or is it soft? Does its volume swell over time or does it quickly decay? Is it overpowering or nearly imperceptible? In fact, loudness determines whether a sound really exists at all. If a sound is so subtle that we can't perceive it, did it really happen? So let's dive into amplitude, since that is, in many ways, the most basic property of a sound. The basic model of a synthesizer, take the Mini Moog Model D here, consists of a handful of oscillators that are then mixed together and run through a filter for tonal shaping. Inside the synthesizer, the oscillators are always on, always oscillating at a constant amplitude. But in general, we don't want to create a continuous tone, but rather discrete notes with beginnings and ends. Notes that we can control like a musician that allow us to articulate the circuits of the synthesizer like an instrument. So after the filter comes the voltage-controlled amplifier, which is a simple circuit that simply turns the volume of a sound up or down. We can turn the final volume knob on the synthesizer to turn the volume of a sound up and down, but inside there's a separate volume knob, the voltage-controlled amplifier, which is turned up and down with voltage to create distinct notes. The keyboard sends a precise voltage to the oscillators to tune them to the correct note. And it also sends a gate signal. The gate signal is zero volts at all times until we press a key, at which point it jumps up to eight volts and stays there all while the key is held. When we release the key, the gate jumps back down to zero volts. 
This simple signal can be used to create notes. When I press a key, the voltage-controlled amplifier is opened all the way and stays open until I let go of the key, at which point the volume is turned down. This is a perfectly valid way to create notes, but it lacks the articulation found on traditional musical instruments. The envelope generator takes in a gate signal and allows us to sculpt a shape that evolves over time, giving a note dynamic articulation. In 1964, composer Vladimir Usachevsky met Bob Moog and heard his synthesizer prototype. Usachevsky had co-founded the Columbia Princeton Electronic Music Center, and at that point was one of the foremost practitioners of electronic music in the United States. Usachevsky noted that the simple on-off behavior of the gate signal lacked dynamics and suggested to Bob an envelope generator, which would take that gate signal and shape it over time. Further, he suggested the envelope generator should have four distinct stages, attack, decay, sustain, and release. Attack sets the time it takes for the envelope to rise from zero volts to its peak at eight volts when we press a key. Set all the way down, we get instant attack, which is perfect for percussive sounds. And when we raise attack, the sound fades in, reminiscent of orchestral swells or softly blown wind instruments. Next, we have the decay and sustain controls. The note will sustain for as long as the gate is held open, but we can set the level at which the note sustains at with the sustain level control. The voltage will die off from its peak at eight volts at the end of the attack phase to the sustain level at a time set by the decay time control. This way we can program a distinct onset phase of our note, which is different from its sustained character. With sustain at max, the note will sustain at its full level, or I can bring it down to about 50%. And if we turn sustain all the way down, there's no sustain to the note at all. And we get percussive plucked sounds. Decay sets the decay time. either instant or a slow gradual die off to the sustain level. Decay and sustain combine to give more nuance to our note shapes. Finally, release sets the amount of time it takes for a note to decay from the sustain level to zero volts when a key is depressed, adding a ringing tail to our notes. Synthesizers such as the Messenger or the Minimo typically have two separate envelopes one to control the amplitude and another to control the filter. We'll talk about filter envelopes more in an upcoming lecture when we discuss filters, but having two separate envelopes, one for the filter and one for the amplitude, gives you the ability to program a lot of nuance into your sound. For an instrument to feel truly musical, we want to be able to communicate with it and express ourselves through it. Electronics can sometimes seem to live in this world of unfeeling logic or strict physical rules. But the closer we can get to those circuits, the more we can respond to them and in turn they can respond to us, the quicker we begin to build a relationship with an instrument. Electronic instruments have many different interfaces, but early in the development of the Moog synthesizer, it was decided that the keyboard was the most practical. Most musicians, after all, have some relationship with the keyboard. As we've seen, the keyboard generates two primary control voltages. The keyboard controls the pitch of the oscillators and sends gates to the envelope. Most modern keyboards contain two additional control voltage sources that allow us to capture more nuance in our playing. The first is called velocity and represents how hard I press a key. If I turn on velocity for the amplitude envelope, then when I press a key softly, the note will be at a lower overall volume than when I press a key harder. 
The envelope shape is always the same, it's just the level that changes. The second is called aftertouch. When I press a key down, I can continue to press the key a little bit. In this case, it's opening the filter. This additional pressure you provide is converted into a signal called aftertouch or afterpressure. It's just a few extra millimeters of key travel, but gives you a lot of added expressive control. Sometimes you may wish you had a third arm for controlling an extra knob while playing your synthesizer. Luckily, most synthesizers have an expression pedal input, allowing you to control a parameter with your foot. The sustain pedal, meanwhile, will sustain a note for as long as the pedal is held down and release the note once you let go of the pedal. Or why not harness the power of electromagnetic radiation to control your synthesizer? Bob Moog didn't get his start developing the first synthesizer, but rather by building theremins in his parents' basement in Queens. The theremin, conceived of by Russian inventor Leon Theremin, allows you to control sound by moving your hands close to antennas in the air. It blew people's minds in the 1920s and still does today. With a theremin, I can control the amplitude with my left hand and pitch with my right hand. We form a bond with an instrument when we feel in control of it, but also a bit intimidated. When an instrument responds to us in an organic way, we feel a connection with the circuits and feel we understand them better. But an instrument must continue to pique our curiosity and give us the feeling that there's always more to explore. Bob himself said it best. When you connect with an instrument, whether it's a guitar or a violin or a set of drums or an electronic instrument, there's an interaction that's outside of what's actually going through your finger. There is a connection. I hesitate to use the word spiritual, but it has to do with the forces that we know we living things can exert and can respond to.